Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Um, so thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, today, I'll just drive you a bit through my journey in the amyloid world from atoms to blobs. And if time allows, then I will also try to, to go back to show more uh, recent results. Uh, we'll see how that goes. But before I really dive in, I want to introduce to you the focus of my group at the University of Amsterdam. So first and foremost, we try to understand and control the aggregation mechanisms of polypeptides with particular focus on amyloidogenic and cancerous polypeptides from very much a multi-scale perspective. Next, we develop uh, coarse-grained models with tunable and responsive properties for proteins and also for biomaterials. And finally, we design peptide-based therapeutics for uh, neurodegenerative diseases. Um, within this large spectrum, we explore solvent effects and allostery. Uh, that means we play very much with the solvents in order to identify new allosteric pockets uh, in proteins that are otherwise undruggable. Or together with my colleagues at the University of Amsterdam, we also look at the really mild effects of solvent modifications on protein dynamics, uh, kinetics and thermodynamics. Um, then we develop coarse-grained models, so really generic models to look at protein aggregation. That means we lump together groups of atoms, like you see over here, into single particles, or even we represent a full protein as a single particle to look at aggregation, formation of different protofilaments which is what I'm going to talk about also today. But we also design these biomaterials that are responsive to external stimuli. And finally, on the peptide design part, we develop these pep uh, uh, peptides that bind to neurodegenerative associated targets and inhibit their toxic transformation. Um, now diving in, and looking really on the, on the scale, on the time and length scales of our simulations, we are really in the classical regime. So we employ everything from um, atomistic simulations in explicit solvent towards the development of mesoscale models. It very much depends on the question that, on the research question that we are focusing on. So on today's menu, we are going to look from atoms and more specifically, we're going to find out more about the interaction of antibodies with the cellular prion protein and how these really modulate the, the interaction with the cellular membrane. We are then going more in the soft matter direction and we'll look at the formation, that the mechanisms of formation of um, oligomeric species that can be blob-like or also elongated. And back, if time allows, I'll show you our strategy towards the design of peptides that bind the cellular prion protein to inhibit its toxic transformation. Now, the question that obviously arises is what are prions? So prions are proteins associated with neurodegenerative diseases, particularly Creutzfeldt-Jakobs in humans or mad cow diseases in bovines. Uh, these, these diseases are linked to the misfolding and the aggregation of the cellular prion protein, also known as PRPC, into an insoluble toxic isoform that is scrape your PRPSC. Now, the difference between these two proteins lies not in their sequence of amino acids, but rather in the structure that they adopt. So for instance, PRPC, the healthy protein is highly soluble, is populated by these three alpha helices you see over here, a small beta sheet, and it's a membrane attached protein. On the other hand, PRPSC, so the toxic isoform is insoluble, rich in beta sheets. This is what I highlight here in, um, in this yellow mesh and has a high aggregation propensity. It was actually proposed that PRPSC um, superimposes, interacts with PRPC, it superimposes its conformation, which eventually leads to the formation of amyloid fibril or other toxic species. Um, 
PRPC is a cell surface glycoprotein. So you see here in the upper right corner that it's attached to the membrane via a GPI anchor. And um, structurally, it consists of two large domains. First, we have the globular domain, which I introduced to you right before. So it has these three alpha helices and is stabilized by, by a disulfide bond. And a 100 residue long flexible tail that is intrinsically disordered, has two positively charged clusters highlighted here in green and uh, five repeat regions that consist each of eight residues. Um, the, the region that actually was proposed to be involved in the formation of amyloid fibrils spans from the C-terminus of the flexible tail all the way into the N-terminus of the globular domain. And a proposed strategy to avoid the tra toxic transformation of the cellular prion protein, so basically linked to the unfolding of the globular domain, was to develop antibodies, particularly monoclonal antibodies that bind PRPC to stabilize its conformation, thereby inhibiting the toxic transformation. And such antibodies are known also, are, are POM, the, is the, belong to the POM family of antibodies. And if we zoom in, we find that, for instance, POM1, it binds into alpha-1 and alpha-3 over here. And it was proposed, uh, it was shown that actually it perpetuates rapid toxicity. On the other hand, POM2, that binds into the flexible tail, was shown to prevent POM1-induced toxicity. And interestingly, POM6, that binds in regions at epitopes very close to POM1 was also shown to be neuroprotective. So our quest was towards understanding how antibody binding affect PRPC, so the prion protein, both structurally and dynamically. And since this is a membrane attached protein, we wanted to understand how, what the interaction mechanisms are with the membrane, both in absence and in presence of the two antibodies, and whether we can identify really some specific differences. And for this, we went for a dual approach. So we first looked at the effects on the intrinsic flexibility of the prion protein, and then we looked at the membrane-bound flexibility and the effects of the flexible tail. Now, in first instance, uh, we used simply the, we started from the crystal structure of the prion protein and the complexes with the two antibodies. And in second instance, we starting from the same crystal structure, we also reconstructed a, a really a coarse membrane to which we attached the prion protein. And we also simulate explicitly the flexible tail. We do this by uh, full atomistic simulations, except in the first in first instance we use explicit solvent simulations, and in second instance because we are limited by our computational um, by the size of the system that limits also our computational efforts, we use implicit solvent simulations and enhanced sampling techniques. So for the first part, we looked at the complex stability flexibility and also its stability, we found actually that the interface between POM6 and the prion protein is less stable than POM1, mainly due to polarized local um, mismatches, uh, to, to localize polar mismatches. And then we looked at the flexibility. And for this, we plotted the root mean square fluctuations of uh, along the C alpha atoms of the residues that construct the globular domain of the prime protein. Now I'll just take a moment to explain the plot because I'm going to use uh, this throughout my talks. So I highlight in the plot by these pink rectangles, the three alpha helices and by the two orange rectangles, the small beta sheet and the vertical lines uh, represent a location of the epitope. So in red POM1 because it's neurotoxic and in green POM6. Uh, the line are the color of the lines are always the same. So in black we have PRPC and in red and green the antibodies. Now what we find, first of all, is that 
antibody binding increases the overall flexibility of the prion protein. And particularly uh, that is localized here at alpha two. And if we map it on the structure of the protein, we see that it really um, increases the overall flexibility of alpha two with predominance at the loops. Uh, now, the striking difference that arises where, where the two antibodies have really an opposite effect is here. So spanning from beta 1 to alpha 1, where we see that the, um, the neuroprotective antibody actually increases the flexibility, whereas the neurotoxic one decreases the flexibility at this loop. Uh, looking further into the details, we actually found that it's also the network of contact is altered. And as an example, I show to you here this triad for three residues, so the lysine, the glutamic acid, and uh, the asparagine. And what we find is that in presence of the neurotoxic antibody, certain groups of contacts are really more populated as compared to where the neuroprotective antibody is attached or when uh, the prion protein alone is uh, sampled. Um, now, further, we also looked at interactions with the membrane. And for this, we attached, um, attached the protein to a very coarse membrane. And this coarse membrane model actually represents uh, is represented by acetate anions that are free to move on a surface. And they are just a representation of the excess charge that arises from the lipid head groups. Uh, we then continued with looking at the sampling that we have uh, of the distance of the elements of the prion protein with respect to this membrane. Uh, so the, this profile by itself doesn't indicate much, except that there is quite some variability. And it makes more sense when we compare it to the systems when the two antibodies are attached to the cellular prion protein. Now, what we find is, first of all, that the distances are decreased across both domains, which indicates that the prion protein is pushed closer to the membrane when the two antibodies are attached. Um, and in second instance, what we see is that the profiles so the um, are different when the two antibodies are attached. Particularly of focus, we see here alpha-2, which indicates uh, which would suggest that has a completely different orientation with respect to the cellular membrane than in the case when the prion protein is, sa is sampled alone. So we continued with looking really closer into this orientation of the helices with respect to the membrane, so the flexibility of, of the prion protein with respect to the membrane. And for that, we actually plot the probability distribution of the angles that these helices form with the membrane normal. And I'll focus just on alpha three. And what we found was actually that when the prion protein is, a, um, is sampled alone, it has a high degree of flexibility. So it moves back and forth. Whereas when the two antibodies are attached, we recover narrower peaks, which indicates a restricted motion of the protein. And because nothing speaks more than, than movies, I will just show you a few movies from our simulations. We see that when the prion protein is alone, it's very dynamic. It dances on the surface of the, of the cellular membrane. Now, when, when POM1 is attached, so the neurotoxic antibody, uh, the motion is indeed restricted, still driven by the flexible tail, and the globular domain has more of a rotating motion around uh, on the surface of the membrane. Now, when POM6 is attached, uh, we actually find that this restriction reflects more in a rotating motion around the long axis of uh, the cellular prion protein. Um, so just to wrap up this part of my talk, we compared systems when uh, two antibodies are attached, a neurotoxic and a neuroprotective one. And we actually saw that they modulate uh, differently, actually the orientational disorder of the, of the globular domain and also of the contacts between different uh, residues within the cellular prime protein. 
So going one step further, actually, there are several hypotheses related to toxicity. And I actually started my talk mentioning that there are certain structural modifications that reach um, lead to beta rich structure and eventually to aggregation of these proteins into, into amorphous structures. So the second part of my talk will actually focus more on, on the aggregation part. And in the amyloid hypothesis, generally we start from a soluble form of the protein that undergoes structural rearrangements. And then under abnormal conditions, it can aggregate proteins that can aggregate, they can nucleate, which eventually gives rise to amyloid fibrils uh, until a saturation state has been reached. When we monitor these phenomena a long time, we get actually, we recover a sigmoidal curve in which we identify three main phases of amyloid growth. So a lag phase in which we have a soup of different elements of different phases of our proteins, a growth phase in which this amorphous elongated structure has formed and a saturation phase when the mature state of the fibril has been reached. Um, in the remaining part of my talk, I will focus really on the early stages, so on the prefibrillar aggregates and the mechanisms by which they form. Now, um, what we know is that these prefibrillar aggregates, they are also known as oligomers, which can undergo by themselves also rearrangement of their components and then form amorphous um, structures stabilized by hydrogen bonds. And up till, uh, let's say more in over the uh, recent years, the, the accepted thought was essentially that we have a bunch of these proteins that aggregate and form these really spherical blob-like oligomers. More recently, it was also experimentally shown that uh, these on-pathway oligomers, they can also form protofilaments that actually have these elongated structures in which monomers attach uh, to each other uh, and can also undergo hierarchical assembly prior to really forming these mature amyloid fibrils that we were talking about. So a few years ago, and, and then we asked ourselves, how what are these aggregation mechanisms in, in the two different cases? So a few years ago, we developed a coarse grained model in which we tried to capture these uh, flexibility, internal flexibility of the proteins to be highly soluble and or disordered in really uh, a um, in, in, the, in their soluble state and they ad can adopt these uh, elongated forms when they are involved in specific aggregates like amyloid fibrils. We achieved this by in introducing an internal potential for our particles, uh, which allowed actually to, for a disordered particle, a disordered protein to become ordered under um, really abnormal conditions. And using this very simple model, we managed to capture the mechanisms, the early mechanisms of fibrillar growth, and particularly that uh, fibrils can grow via one step, so spontaneously, or via two steps. That means through the formation of oligomers, and particularly the formation of these spherical oligomers. Um, in more recent years, actually, we started asking ourselves about the protofilaments and the mechanisms of formation of these protofilaments. And for this, we teamed up with uh, the group of Professor Ruggeri at the University of Wageningen and Bernadette uh, Meyer. She, she's a very talented student that performed all the simulations that I'm going to, uh, to talk about right now. So to capture actually these phenomena that were observed in experiments, we introduced really a new coarse-grained model in which we represent a single protein as a single sphere with two attractive patches on the surface. We described the interaction between two of these particles, first of all, by an excluded volume interaction to not allow overlap between the particles. Also, the particles can attract each other, mimicking hydrophobic interaction. But we also introduce a directionality driven by the interaction between the two patches. 
um, as uh, described and also uh, seen in experiments. So what Bernadette looked at first was the formation of single-stranded protofilaments that they uh, that in Simone's group they had already uh, observed with AFM experiments. We we rapidly managed to reproduce actually the formation of these single-stranded protofilaments by varying the interactions between the spheres, so purple purple, and between the patches, which was orange orange. But we look, went one step further and we managed to explain the mechanisms of formation of, of these single-stranded protofilaments. And this, we, what we found is that this extends beyond just the simple monomeric addition at the ends of a preformed nucleus to actually be more complex. So first of all, we saw that single-stranded protofilaments that are preformed, they can break and they can self-fold onto themselves. They can separate to form to give rise to actually two of these uh, protofilaments. They can divide eventually and merge again to form an elongated protofilament. We found that these uh, the formation of these aggregates is driven by both specific and non-specific interaction, and they I, they are very dynamic and highly flexible, as highlighted in the movie in the bottom right corner. Now, this was the simple part of the story, and we continued with the formation of multi-stranded protofilaments. In experiments, they also saw the formation of double-stranded protofilaments, and our simulations revealed the fact that these are rather short and transient species. That means they are on pathway, and they occur um, in the process of of the formation of higher ordered uh, aggregates, which uh, aggregates of higher ordered protofilaments um, through joining at the ends or at the sides to give rise really to more stable structures. We found that they are more rigid than their single protofilament precursors. And this uh, is valid for, for all the multi-stranded protofilaments. Um, uh, when we looked at the mechanisms of formation of these multi-stranded protofilaments, we found that they can form either via spherical oligomers driven mainly by non-specific interactions, but yet stabilized by specific interactions, so between the patches upon monomer addition. They can also uh, form via breakage of single protofilaments that do not separate from each other, but rather continue the growth and form, again, a stable multi-stranded protofilament. Or they can merge uh, between species and then undergo several rearrangements. So for instance, in the example here at the bottom, we have these two species that merge at the ends, however, in an imperfect fashion. And what we found was that in the rearrangement process, if we look here at the at the blue particle, it takes really pretty much the same amount of time as the entire simulation so far to find its way to the end of the aggregate and rearranged. So just to wrap up, what Bernadette did was essentially vary the interactions between the spheres and the patches, and she managed to identify the formation of different species ranging from these spherical oligomers to single-stranded uh, protofilament and multi-stranded protofilament. And in my last minute, I will just very briefly tell you about our efforts to design inhibitors that uh, against the misfolding and trans toxic transformation of the prion protein. So basically we rely on a rational design and we design a peptide that binds to the cellular prion protein. We test its stability via simulations and we also, uh, check, um, investigate the binding free energies in uh, an attempt to improve the binders that we design prior to testing them in an experimental setup. And we do this essentially mainly we rely on rational design in our simulations. 
uh, and we incorporate them in a peptide optimization in a, um, a feedback loop based on active learning. Um, now with this, I hope I have shown to you very quickly our latest results on the interaction and the effects of antibodies on the cellular prion protein and its interaction with the membrane. I hope I convinced you that oligomerization is not is more than just blobs. And unfortunately, time didn't allow me to tell you more about our more exciting results, but maybe at the next edition at some point next year. And with this, I'd like to thank everyone that um, performed the work, particularly here um, Bernadette, who did really uh, wonderful work on the course trained model, uh, our computational chemistry group, the funding agencies, and of course you for your attention, and I'll happily take any questions. <laughs>